BioBalance HealthCast episode 189. There is more to HRT than replacing estrogen. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This week, Dr. Maupin and I are going to be talking about uh, the common usage, common wisdom, the vernacular of some terminology that gets bandied about in a lot of places, and as a result of differing interpretations, there's a lot of misinterpretation, misunderstanding. And what, what we're going to be talking about is hormone replacement therapy, HRT, or estrogen replacement therapy, ERT. Those are key words or terms, uh, acronyms, that mm-hmm. get thrown around, and they mean different things to different people, and none of those are quite precise. Right. So, so generally, when people hear hormone replacement therapy or estrogen replacement therapy, little alarms go off in their head, and they think breast cancer, uh, and, and 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 they think only estrogen. And they think only estrogen, the, even though technically ERT is estrogen replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. When you say HRT, what most people are thinking about is estrogen, and that's it's also progesterone <clears throat> or progestin. So HRT is really estrogen plus progestin, and that's okay. what it means to doctors. Right. That's not what it means to the public. And how does that relate to breast cancer? In all caps. Are you asking me or are you I'm asking me? you, yeah. <laughs> so, so basically when the WHI study came out, it said mm-hmm. HRT causes breast cancer or increases right. the risk of breast cancer as the headline. So, so you had, at that time, you had a groundswell of women and their doctors who felt that they had really found a, a positive treatment for helping women age and stay healthy. And suddenly mm-hmm. the well was poisoned because this positive treatment caused all these women to get breast cancer. And so they put the screeching halt on it and said, oh my God, don't get hormone replacement therapy. It'll kill you. <laughs> well, that's, that's what happens when, like, you ignore 2,500 studies that came before it. Yeah, well. And then one study with a misleading headline says HR, HRT mm-hmm. causes breast cancer. Well, it what they did was they misinterpreted the research. And it has now been not retracted, but many other studies have come out showing well, they, that it they, wasn't l- true. They literally jumped to a conclusion. Right. They cut the research short because they thought they had found this significant piece of information that was earth-shattering. Mm-hmm. And when they went back later then and broke it down into little steps and A connects to B connects to C, they discovered that it wasn't the estrogen, estrogen that Not was estrogen. causing the problem. And so It the, was Provera, which was the progestin. Yes. And that was the only cause. So they should have had an, a headline that said... Progestins or Provera, in particular, increases the risk of breast cancer, and that's yeah. true. Right. So Provera, like Depo Provera. Right. So that was the only part of the study that increased breast cancer. But the reason we're talking about the definitions is it's important for you to know what the the person that's writing a headline or a story mm-hmm. is really talking about. Mm-hmm. So if they say ERT, that means just estrogen replacement. HRT means estrogen in some form with a progestin in some form. Kind of like HRT is similar to, to birth control pills. Right. It's just given to a to a, an older person. So basically, they're the same estrogens and the same progestins that are given in birth control pills. Seriously. Right. <laughs> and But they are given to women after menopause. Okay, so following the continuum of concern and reasoning about estrogen... Estrogen is a hormone that is that is used by the body to facilitate the fertile cycle, mm-hmm. uh, the menstrual cycle, and mm-hmm. so then in in talking comprehensively about estrogen and the replacement of estrogen, we have to talk about the issue of bleeding. Right, and the biggest risk and the biggest um, issue I've ever had to talk to a patient all my patients after menopause about mm-hmm. is if I gave if I give you hormone estrogen replacement and you have a uterus, then I have to give you progesterone or progestin to balance it so you don't bleed. But sometimes bleeding still happens. It's the biggest risk of anybody taking estrogen in any form is, is that uterine they will bleeding. Get bleeding. Right. And nobody wants to bleed after menopause, at least 
Nobody I've ever talked to. Yeah. So, so that was. It, Nobody it, sits around and says, "Gosh, I really missed that." Yeah. Well, I think long ago there were a lot of doctors, that, male doctors, that misinterpreted it and thought mm-hmm. that that was a great idea. One of the ways they made their own lives easier is they gave cyclic progestin to people, just like a birth control pill would, estrogen and progestin for three weeks, and then off of everything for a week, and then then postmenopausal women would then have to bleed. Hmm. So that would empty the uterus out and it would then keep they would have scheduled bleeding. So that made it easier for the doctor. They got fewer phone calls because it was scheduled bleeding. But we know that if you give a proper estrogen and progestin dose or progesterone dose and the let me qualify this and the uterus is normal, yeah. then you should be able to manage a patient with those two hormones and not ever have them bleed. You will keep the lining very thin. Okay? So that's assuming the uterus is normal. So so assuming the uterus is normal and the woman has gone through menopause and is not normally bleeding and she begins to bleed, what does that suggest to doctors? Why do doctors take that as a concern? This is without taking hormone replacement. She just begins to bleed. After menopause, if you start to bleed, if a patient starts to bleed, then... We think, Mm -hmm. first thought is, oh, uterine cancer. We need to look at the lining of the uterus, not the out, not the muscle, Mm -hmm. but that lining that usually sheds when we're young, sheds every month. Uh That lining can get thicker and thicker and thicker, even after menopause. And that those cells can become cancerous. So if somebody hasn't had, had a period in three years and they're menopausal and all of a sudden they start to bleed, that's the first thing that a doctor thinks of. So then that has to be investigated. Right. So even if if you're on, usually it's when you're not on any hormones and that's spontaneous. Usually we ask a patient to, we ask our women to come in and get an ultrasound. So then we look at the uterine wall and make sure it's normal. You can see with the ultrasound. We can see the whole uterus. And then we look at the lining. And that's where we look for the thin or thickness. Mm -hmm. And if it's really thick then that needs to come out. It needs to be cleaned out, and that's called a DNC. And all of that looked at by a pathologist to make sure it's not cancer or precancer. But that we also see other things when we look at an, at an ultrasound. We, we can see fibroids, and fibroids are one of those deal breakers. You can give somebody the perfect dose of estrogen and progesterone, and they might still bleed because the fibroid doesn't have the same receptor sites as the rest of the uterus. Okay. And so it just sometimes is stimulated to grow with estrogen, and it sometimes just bleeds. So that causes a, a problem for those of us who are replacing hormones for postmenopause. So so we can see if somebody has fibroids. We can see if somebody has um, a big spongy uterus from having a lot of pregnancies. Uh, if they have that, then the lining doesn't have to be a problem, but they could still bleed because the uterus is spongy and soft. So primarily doctors are worried about bleeding because they're worried about preventing uterine cancer. But when they do the first test in the series of tests that you do, when you look at the um, ultrasound, you can tell lots of things. You You can say, well, maybe she's bleeding from fibroids if the lining's thin, or if everything's perfect, then generally that's going to be some imbalance between the progesterone and the estrogen. So, so Kathy, why wouldn't women just as a matter of course consider having their uterus taken out? If, if they're not going to be fertile anymore and that bleeding cycle is uh, potentially so problematic, what would be the argument for or against a preventive surgery? Well, it, it's, it, that was very common when I was first trained back back in the um, 70s and 80s. It was mm-hmm. really common to have, you're done with your uterus, whoop, and it was birth control and it was everything else. But there's a lot of, there's a huge risk in having surgery at all. If you, if okay. you don't have yes. a life-threatening th- illness or problem right. or something that's causing you pain or something that's causing, that is a potential life-threatening issue, you shouldn't go in under anesthesia. Under you shouldn't. I mean, it's right. it's a risk. Right. So yeah, they always to, make you sign that little release that says yeah, you know you, you could, could die. you could die from anesthesia. Yeah. So you, it's not. It. I mean, I can't even remember ever having somebody die under anesthesia in any of my hospitals that I right. worked in. But, but it's always in a, a right. risk. Right. So you don't want to take risks with your body, and 
Yes, it sounds really easy because people without a uterus are easier to to manage because they don't have this one big risk, which is bleeding. Mm -hmm. I don't have a uterus. It's much easier to replace estrogen because I don't have to take the progesterone along with it, and I don't have to worry about that problem. I can take what I need Mm -hmm. and not worry about bleeding. But the risk of surgery, the risk of it by taking the uterus out, if sometimes it leaves an area of weakness so that... The, the bladder doesn't work as well and things like that. So there's other things that yeah. that can happen. And um, even though I always left the cervix in when I'd operated, most doctors don't. So so that removes one of the sites of orgasm. So it can even be a sexual thing. So to me, that's that's like, you know, hitting a fly with a base, baseball bat. Yeah. I mean, basically. Yeah. So we can we can manage this. Yeah, so when you do In that whole ways. cost-benefit ratio thing where you sit down and say, oh, we can do this, and this is what would happen if we did, and this is what would happen if we didn't. Right. It's not even the cost. It's just the risk. Well, risk the risk benefit. is a cost. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's one way. Now, now if, if somebody has doesn't want to bleed anymore, they can actually get the lining of the uterus ablated. And that's something different. It's a one day. It's a one day, very short surgery where. And some people are doing it in the office under. So burn it out with a laser. Well, we used to do that, but now there are uh, balloons that are filled with hot water that circulate, uh-huh. and we numb up. We numb up the uterus. Cook or them. I used to. Yeah, we cook them. You just and cook them. You you put it on the inside. It's like pretend the uterus is a cantaloupe. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Yeah, I, that was disrespectful. I know. No, no. I, <laughs> just like. Well, that's what yeah. you're talking. Parboil. We're burning. We're, there's a lot of burning in surgery. We cauterize vessels, and yeah. we we use that's an old fashioned but very effective way to keep people from bleeding. So, anywhere. So usually you can go in through the cervix and you put in this little balloon and circulate hot water for eight minutes. And if somebody's numb there by getting a pair of cervical, that's it. They don't feel it. They right. cramp for a day. All of it slough, All the dead tissue sloughs off, uh-huh. comes out, okay. and they're done bleeding. And Forever. it's it's like ninety five percent effective. So wow! Unless you're in the five percent, you're done bleeding. So that that's a really good way to stop bleeding. Right. The third way, and that, then you wouldn't need the progesterone. Right. Okay. And we usually we give a little tiny low dose of progesterone. Just we don't want to we don't want to tempt that five percent to bleed. Yeah. <laughs> so Trace. if you've been ablated, we usually use estrogen pellets, and then we give um, usually a progesterone pellet, but not a very high dose, and that just keeps everything on those tiny cells that may not have been burned. Keeps keeps you from bleeding from there. We we don't want to tempt fate. So now, when, so so when you were doing gynecological practices, those were things that you could do in your office. You no yeah. longer do that though. No, I so don't do it. You would refer that out. Yeah, I send them to all, all the very good gynecologists here in St. Louis. Sure. Okay. So the third thing, what to do if you are having bleeding and it's not cancer, mm-hmm. and you want to take hormones, besides taking progesterone, is to put a Mirena IUD in and just a Mirena, not the other kind, because uh, any other kind, because Mirena has a little progesterone package that lasts five years. And instead of putting progesterone throughout your body, and some people don't tolerate it very well, then it's just a little tiny bit of progesterone inside the uterus. So we insert that into the into the uterus and it deploys. So these little ram's horns kind of kind of open Hooks up. On. And then on on this um, on this little piece of plastic there's a package of progesterone that lasts five five to seven years for bleeding. Mm-hmm. So five five years for birth control. So we use that. And it's just a tiny dose is delivered at the site, right there in the uterus, and not running through the whole system. Right. You you don't absorb. I mean, some people who are very sensitive will absorb a tiny bit of it, and they might even. I had one person think she felt it, which I I don't get because her progesterone level in her blood was very very low. So so, like, but typically not using you know, the marine IUD, you would take like a sublingual tablet mm-hmm. that would dissolve under your tongue, and it would spread through your whole system. Yeah, you get progesterone everywhere, so that. You get your uterus, there. yeah. Your uterus could it could be balanced with the estrogen. Yeah. But you're getting estrogen everywhere too. Okay. So, but uh, those are the, those are the ways we use to stop bleeding mm-hmm. or prevent bleeding. But in someone who's already been bleeding, we have to actually get a biopsy in the office, or we have to clean out the lining and look at it to make sure there's no cancer there before we do anything else. So, so what about uh, the drug Arimidex? Then where does that fall into all Okay, of well, um, Arimidex is a drug that we use to prevent breast cancer, and we use it when 
that some of our patients make testosterone into an old woman's estrogen, estrone. Mm-hmm. And so we Arimidex blocks that. So it, it decreases risk for breast cancer. It decreases uh, uterine bleeding, especially from fibroids. Okay. Because fibroids don't respond very well to progesterone. But if we shut down the estrone, if we decrease estrone throughout the body, then the fibroids usually do, do not grow. Okay. So I, I so that's sh- bleeding from fibroids. Stupid question. Uh, or what? ignorant question, <laughs> not a stupid question. Well, uh, can tell me more about what a fibroid is. Is it a tumor? Is it a like a ropey mess of fibers that grows like a cancer grow? What is it that you would be okay. concerned about? The the uter the, it's genetic. Mm-hmm. Women, it runs in families. Women ha- usually are Mediterranean or or Southern European descent or or African American. We all have uh, a higher risk of it, mm-hmm. but they are benign. They're not cancer. Okay. They they grow under the influence of estrogen. They are a they're a a whirl a whirl <laughs> of of uh, muscle cells that when you if you cut one it it looks like a ball of string but it's not mm-hmm. really string I mean it's fibrous tissue and it's not just fibrous fibrous and muscle and they only get them in the uterus or can they get them in other parts of the body well, you can get fibrous growths elsewhere but a fibroid is considered is something considered in the uterus. uterus okay and we I've seen them on the ovaries as well because I thought I knew some women that had concerns about that's uh, fibrocystic disease completely different thing okay. Right, so that's thank a you. different thing. So fibroids look, I mean, they can make your uterus, I mean, a uterus should be like as big as my fist. Mm-hmm. And they can make a non-pregnant uterus. Yeah. And they can make your uterus yeah. like that. I mean, I've taken out baby-sized uteruses. Wow. Makes people's bellies stick out to here. And yeah. I mean, they can really grow. Usually that's when women have the hormones where they're fertile before menopause rarely would anything grow like that after menopause because we don't give that much estrogen you have a lot more estrogen before menopause and when we replace it we give a fraction of what you had before so as a physician you talk a lot in our podcast about talking to people and looking at people and that you can see sometimes just from the pallor of their skin that you ought to check out about cardiac histories and issues. Mm -hmm. You can Mm -hmm. see sometimes with a goiter that there are iodine questions. Can you see uh, fibroid tumor? You're talking about somebody's belly being Mm -hmm. large and stuff. Can you see that visually or is it something that you have to have an ultrasound? You have to have... uh, Well, in the old days before we had ultrasounds in every office and every room, we uh, did a pelvic exam, which meant two fingers are in the vagina and mm-hmm. one hand's on the abdomen. Mm-hmm. And so you bring you bring your hands together like this to feel How the size. Or... No, the size of the uterus. Okay. You can actually feel the size of the uterus. You go, you can feel the cervix first, and then you put your hand around it. And usually it's very small, so you can get your hand all the way around the uterus. Huh. There's I. And in people who are really big, I could use my, my fingers are long enough that I could get around the uterus from below, from the vagina. But if you have fibroids, your fingers are in the vagina and your hand's up here. Right. Or you or you put your hand around it and you feel this irregular shape instead of this nice little pair. Right. So that would then stimulate a doctor to then look at the uterus and say, what is this? Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes fibroids. I mean, like less than 0.1 percent of a fibroid w- might have a a change that looks like cancer called yeah. sarcoma. So we're very concerned about fast growing fibroids. Right. That would be a sign of something not so good. So we would take those out right away. Oftentimes, women live with their fibroids. So they don't have it taken out. Summarize. HRT. Most people think it's estrogen, although there is there is a term, ERT, for estrogen replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. And they replace what your body naturally supri- supplies because as you get older, mm-hmm. the natural supply diminishes. So and we use HRT, we can it. Mm-hmm. which is estro- estrogen in some form, and progesterone or progestin in some form. Mm-hmm. ERT is for people with, with uh, hysterectomies. They don't need the progestin. Right. So it's pure estrogen. Pure estrogen. All right. So that's what ERT me- means. Mm-hmm. And then we go to what are the side effects? This is what are the side effects of taking estrogen after menopause in any form? Right. So this isn't just pellets. In fact, 
it happens in everybody who takes estrogen of any type and has a uterus, bleeding is the biggest risk. Yes. Not that it's life-threatening. It's just a hassle and no one wants it. So we try very hard not to have it happen. So the first thing you check then when there's bleeding is, is that an indication of cancer? Right. We rule that out. You rule that out. And then you look at, okay, so what's causing the bleeding? Is it a fibroid? Is it not enough progestin? Uh, does it, do, do they need a DNC? Uh, is it just a thick lining that's not cancer? Yeah, that they could ablate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so then you go through the checklist so that women who are postmenopausal don't have to deal with the issue of bleeding, but still can have the estrogen that their body needs. Right, right. Safely. And- and this so and, and we do this every day and 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 we I would love it if everybody would get a morena because those patients stop bleed they don't bleed and they don't have to take anything every day and they don't have to miss it like if you miss your progesterone a couple of days you might bleed yeah things trace. like yeah. yeah so so to me it's the easy it's an easy thing so once every five years you have a morena put in in the uterus and then the uterus behaves and for most women will insurance pay for that for most women. They will pay for that, but not every insurance pays for Morena's. Right. Okay. So we, that's why we have other choices. So it's not a, it's not a deal breaker. Right. I mean, bleeding doesn't have to be, oh, I'm not, I, I don't want to bleed again. I'm not taking estrogen. Right. Because there's so many benefits to estrogen. Like you can think again and <laughs> your, your vagina doesn't hurt. And mm-hmm. when you have sex and it isn't shriveled up and tiny. So, I mean, mm-hmm. there's your hair grows in the front of your head. You know, all of these things are estrogen. And your skin's right. soft. All of these things are things we took for granted. But, we, you know, it, it's not a deal breaker to have bleeding. We can work our way around it as long as the patient's willing to work her way around so, it. So the good news is that men and women both can restore their body's natural hormone levels to what they were when they were younger and healthier. And that at each consideration, there are questions that have to be asked uh-huh, and answered, uh-huh. but there are treatments that can offset concerns in almost every case. Right. The, the point is you need to know to ask, and your doctor needs to know the answers, and then together you develop a, an informed patient consent situation uh-huh. where they know what they're getting treated for, and they're happy with the outcomes. Right, right. And and it's it's up to you to tell your doctor what you really want. Mm-hmm. And if they say, oh, you don't need that, and you say, well, I really want to do this, right. then they should do it for you. I mean, it's your request. You're the patient. And it's your body. So you should be able to get what you what you want. All right. So as always, we thank you for listening and hope you come back next time. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.